Hey, everybody. Um, OK, first, I guess just thank you for putting this on. I, this is great. Um, normally, when I've given talks. I'm like, demoing some software I've made. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more narrative about sort of my experiences and uh, how I ended up writing code, maybe a little bit. Uh, but the basics of the talk is I, I've been part deaf uh, pretty much my whole life. And you probably wouldn't guess by looking at me that. Um, and but, you know, I can I can get on in conversation as long as my right ear is pointing towards you. A um, little better, like that. Ah, okay, perfect. Um, but yeah, like that. So, uh, if my left ear was pointing to you, it would be like I wasn't talking into the mic. Um, so I tried hearing aids; they don't really work. And things like that. Um, I also uh, was diagnosed with Meniere's about five years ago when I started getting really bad episodes of vertigo. Um, so uh, I guess a little bit of background, or what does that have to do with tech and games? Um, well, I've been writing code for over 20 years. Um, and I sort of, I never went to school really. I took an intro to programming class. But mostly I just felt that sort of having sort of broken sensory experience throughout my life and uh, sort of made me analytical and play with and observe uh, or try to observe sort of what was going on behind how things came to be in my mind, how patterns evolved, and um, how to find solutions for, for whatever happened to me. Uh, the most immediate way that this came up as a child was in language. I, I had no idea what people were saying. They would sound like blah, 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 blah. Um, kind of like the peanuts when the kids hear people, the, the parents talking, it's just scribble. Um, so uh, over time, I guess I developed some ability to follow visual cues and a little bit of lip reading. Uh, I didn't realize this until I was about 20. Uh, and I was on a train in uh, Europe somewhere crossing from one country to another, and nobody spoke English. They were talking to each other in, I think, German. And I was able to follow the conversation. And I think that was my first real clue that you know, different perspectives or the way that having a disability where it'll alter your perception somewhat, you can use to use perception in different ways uh, and find that there's a lot of more to communication um, they might just be expressed in the base language like that we write down. Um, so that's basically how I, uh, how I sort of first realized this. Uh, shortly after that, I did start working in tech. I was very uh, visually oriented, and I became a bit obsessed over like, visual communication and graphics and things like that. At the time, I started. Like the 90s, I worked on VRML, and I thought that at the time, I thought, you know, it's a great new way to, to express things that couldn't really be expressed in language or could reach out to people that don't hear or whatever other disabilities they might have uh, in other ways. And I mean, there are accessibility features of software, but generally it doesn't. Um, I don't know, it doesn't give that sense of sort of exploration or um, the, that I had found on my own. Um, so that, um, you see, so a couple things about the nature of my condition. Like I said before, I'm only part deaf. So uh, you wouldn't think, I mean, people who are fully deaf also, you might see them and you might not know that they're disabled. Um, it's some interesting uh, conversations over the years. People are actually, like, they just don't believe that I am, that I, I'm joking with them or something. They don't understand if I don't understand what they're saying or I look at them with my right ear. Um, so those aren't, people don't understand. I'm not trying to offend them or whatever or being weird. But I'm just trying to get the most out of um, communicating with them. So, um, that is a general background. Um, let's see, coming up to more recent times with the Meniere's disease uh, in the past five years is um, very episodic and irregular. The, I don't have a typical Meniere's diagnosis, but the way it generally works is people will have 
drastic drops in hearing and episodes of vertigo and dizziness, and then they'll get a little better, but it'll slowly decline over time. Uh, for me, I, I lost the hearing when I was really young, and the vertigo came later. Um, no. But so I had I was developing this um, general bias towards visual communication and visual expression and trying to see what sort of, I don't want to say hidden aspects of expression or experience or perception there were, but it, they're not always there. People don't always look for them. You need to sort of be forced in some ways um, to look for them. I have found in some cases that some meditation techniques can be similar to the ways you can explore your perceptions, but Generally, you need to have some sort of commitment, like you're practicing meditation, or you don't have a choice. Like there's some force constraint on you, like you don't hear well, or um, you know, fill in the blanks. It could be anything. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah. So, and another thing, just on the um, my personal side for these experiences with perception and uh, vertigo is I found that I need to trade off almost my because my my vestibular function is pretty broken from all the vertigo and I've had surgery on my vestibular nerve and so that that's sort of a mess um, but so my I tend to it seems like I commit some of my proprioception to try to accommodate it for it. So I'll end up doing weird things, like in order to be able to balance, I will not see what's in front of me and I'll walk into a table or a wall, uh, things that should be at eye level, um, which is bizarre and weird. Um, but um, so that, this is like a classic trade-off sort of situation where nothing's perfect on either side, but you know, you, you want to be able, I want to be able to move and I don't want to, so um, that's a, not a perfect trade-off, but uh, these are the types of things that I found that I have to deal with. And in some ways, I think that that's really, discovering those things are really useful and helpful in the rest of life. And I'm not going to specifically like, make analogies to programming and developing software, but I find a lot of them uh, regularly. Excuse me. Um, so back to visual communication or visualization as um, a practice. I, I mean, sort of like internally visualizing things, not like data visualization, making pretty charts, uh, which is fun. But um, so, I mean, normally visualization, we think of we're imagining something. All right, you're you're doing fantasy land uh, in your head, and there's a certain sense where. Um, that can seem more real or exploring those things can make what we normally perceive as it makes reality seem a little less concrete and more um, involved. It's, your, it's an active thing that you're sort of cultivating. Um, and in modern times, things change all the time. Our understanding of science, our technologies, the way we get on with life. It's not like people used to maybe farm their whole lives and now maybe every five years, the, what careers exist change. So um, for me, I see that as sort of a continuation of the way that perception can shape um, further perceptions and our sense of how to put it together. So um, one of the main ways that I at least initially used visualizations was uh, pretty much like a meditation, trying to find ways to deal with pain. Along with um, the deafness, I got lots of migraine problems and inner ear pain, um, and to the point where I could become disoriented. Um, and so visualizations seemed to help. In some cases, they felt a bit like escapism. Um, but there were also ways that it calmed me down, maybe helped me to accept things. Um, and again, to keep questioning how how perception influences life. Um, so I I got a little bit obsessed with that maybe at some point because less pain is good. But for 
the approach and the practices. Um, sometimes it can be too much and you can get lost in them and lose context. And I think for meditation practice, they call that meditation sickness. Um, but I didn't know anything about that at the time. Um, it just, you know, I wanted to be in less pain. And this seemed to work, but it also seemed to make me feel more distanced from the reality of physical experience. <coughs> and that, I guess, sort of brought me back to the notion about how reality gets constructed sort of at large, and perception leads into that. Um, I think one example, I keep talking about parallels between exploring perception and meditation. Uh, a simple example I could give you, something I used to do in college, was I would try to focus on two separate points. Like normally in a, in a grass field, I would try to look at two trees separately and you try to focus on them and you can't, you can go back and forth with one in focus or you can sort of try to approximate it in the middle and both of them are sort of good enough in focus, but you're not, you're really focusing on something invisible in the air. And um, that somewhat, or at least to me, that first clued me into the way that perception often fills in the blanks and you're really seeing just a, a few frames of visual input per second, but it, everything feels very continuous. And when my Meniere's first really, the vertigo really got bad, I, there were times when it felt like I was I couldn't string them together because I couldn't orient where things were coming from. And um, it, would be, it would be like seeing individual frames in a slide, but that was where I was standing. It was just like click, click, and there was no continuity. And those times were really, really scary, I guess. And um, uh, I think anxiety producing would probably be the, the best way to phrase it. Um, because I thought, like, I was used to whatever deafness I had. I didn't really think that, part of me, I didn't even think when things were wrong with me that it might be related to my ear. It was just something that happened. It was normal. That's how I grew up. Um, so that was really very disturbing. And um, I would say that that's, um, I guess, are content warnings for mental health. That's generally where the most problems from that came. There were a couple points where, um, combined with uh, long-term like pain from uh, migraines that would last over a week and the disorientation from the vertigo, and I would I would really just freak out. Um, and it took me a long many years to sort of come to terms with this, and it eventually it, it was um, I just had to sort of accept things as they were. Um, I went through a bunch of doctors and everything made me worse. And it was, I would just reach a point where I had to take a step back and say, you know, it's the meditation practices or whatever that I used to do that help, I just need to put them in context and just chill. And so the hardest thing still now for me is just walking because I can walk without falling, but it's very hard to do it without straining and being tense because I'm, I'm expecting to fall. In a specific way, it always goes the same direction. And so you you buffer against that and then it leads you to or it leads me to to not to not walk right. And so I end up learning having to learn and practice things like mobility and basic physical movement, which I never would have done on my own. I guess it keeps me healthy. Um, but I there's a lot of little bits of things that I get to learn about the way that the body works that I would ignore or not bother with if I was working on a computer all day. Um, so in a sense, even though I would much rather not have these problems, especially from surgery, I'm sort of grateful that they did, that I've, they've shown me what, I've, what they have and I've been able to learn what I have because of them. Um, and so, I guess lastly, I'll, um, one, one of the things that does happen to me is uh, being around other people is people, just being active is one of the main things that triggers my vertigo. So I'll isolate a lot. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And in some of the more extreme isolation times, it 
becomes increasingly hard, I found, to, to think clearly or to make sense out of things, even though like any individual sentence I might say to myself sounds logical. It, something slowly starts to seem to not add up. And this made me, uh, gave me a realization uh, sometime last year, I think, which is uh, to do with the nature of meaning. Um, and that meaning is basically, it's an act of its own creation. It's meaning is something that you do and you cultivate and it comes out of you. It's not something that you retrieve. It, it requires commitment or intent and it, it's just like any other process in life. It, it's a continual thing that unflow, unfolds. Um, and so in a sense, we're all just fighting our own mil meaning and it builds our sort of consensual ideas of what reality is. And um, for meaning to really have an impact on us as humans, it seems we need interaction. We need other people to catalyze it. And the more homogenized that is, sort of the less it seems to, to be useful or, I mean, too circular to say it, it is less meaningful. But um, it, it, it's just more limiting. And meaning is sort of about exploring life and finding the best things in it and making the most of them. And so I I think things like diversity are at the core of that. And that's one of the reasons why I was so excited to come here and uh, talk about um, these things with all you. So um, that, is, that is my talk. Um, I, not sure if anybody would have questions for me, um, but uh, yeah, if if you'd like to know anything about uh, me or disability or whatnot, um, go ahead, uh, fire away. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>